All right, Tommy, COVID has been hard on the auto industry. It's been hard on the brands. So in this podcast, we're going to be talking about the automotive brands that are killing it and those that are getting killed. Absolutely. I think it's going to be a really fun podcast because there are certain companies which are just knocking it out of the park with every new product in their lineup in general. There's other ones that have really good products and some pretty bad ones. And then there's ones where we're like, what the heck's going on over there? Um, so we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about some of the cool cars we've driven, including the new Hyundai Palisade, which I just got back from. So we'll have all the details on that. Some other things going around the office, this new project you're working on with 390s convertibles and a little bit of everything else in between. And Tommy, before we roll the intro, we're going to be at a meet and greet. I think we haven't done this forever. Um, we're always just simply too busy uh, to do a meet and greet, but we're coming up to uh, the Overland Expo here in Colorado, and myself, Nathan, Andre, and David are going to be there for two days to meet and greet people. So let's roll the intro and let's get right into it. Welcome to TFL Talk, the official podcast of TFL Studios, where we talk about the best, and yes, even sometimes the worst new cars. We talk about the coolest and sometimes the least uncool old cars. And of course, we give you an insider's view of all things automotive. And hopefully we do it having fun and sometimes arguing. So if you're driving, keep driving. And if you're not, why not? Now, in case you're wondering, that is the Overland Expo Mountain West, the one in Colorado, which is coming up at the very end of August. I think it's like, what, the 27th, 28th? At, at that, exactly right, yeah. That weekend. Yeah, so if you want to meet the team and even see our F-150 Lightning in person with the four-wheel camper on it, it'll be there. So, pretty cool thing. Let me give you the times. Okay. We're, we're not going to be there the whole day, unfortunately. We, once again, have to cover the news. But on Friday, we're going to be at the uh, Fox Shock booth. Uh, from 2 to 3. And on Saturday, we're going to be at the uh, four-wheel camper booth from 2 to 3. So that's what, the 26th of August is the Friday, and then the 27th of August is the Saturday. Yeah, we're going to be handing out stickers from our lightning trip, and we're going to be hopefully meeting all of our fans and, uh, you know, just just saying hi to you because we love the fact that you guys listen to us. So thank you very much. Uh, so shall we get right into it? I think we should, absolutely. So I was just on a trip this past weekend. That's not true. I was there Monday through Wednesday. But I was in Asheville, North Carolina, driving the new refreshed Hyundai Palisade, the 2023 model. This is the large Hyundai three-row SUV. And this is a good way to kind of kick off the show because Hyundai and Kia are one of the brands that are absolutely killing it with their new products recently. Yeah. Uh, and I got to say, I'm looking at the picture of this, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're also looking at it. It looks very similar. They made the grill a little bit more uh, bold, uh, but uh, the Palisade uh, looks a little bit more modern, a little bit cleaner, but uh, very similar to the outgoing model. It's a little bit more flush on the front end, kind of like the new Range Rover. It's got some tweaks uh, on the inside. So this one, which we're looking at is a top trim model, $52,000, but the amount of tech and comfort you get for 52,000. This is kind of like a Mercedes GLS, the big Mercedes SUV, but for $30,000 less, you get this incredible accent lighting, just like the Mercedes. You get a suede headliner, this yacht style wood trim on the inside. It's got um, reclining second row captain's chairs. It's got heated seats, even in the third row. They went nuts with this thing on the inside. One thing I don't like, it only has one massaging seat. Okay, and I'm taking, I'm going to take that that is not <laughs> the rear uh, passenger, but the driver. Yeah, it's the driver's seat, exactly, is the only massaging seat. I always thought that was kind of goofy. But I, apart from that, really good car. Uh, I don't like massage. I want to confess something. I do not like massaging seats. I find them pokey and weird. And, I, and, and maybe, to be fair, I don't like massages. So... You know, I don't like massages real, <laughs> and I don't like massages as fake. So you, you just don't like to be massaged, huh? No, no. I mean, uh, to me, like when I'm driving, I, I, I want to enjoy the, the experience of being one with the car. The seat doing this weird pokey thing. And look, here's how a massaging seat works, right? There's not rollers in the back of the thing. There's no like, like you know, fake hands, you know, kind of kneading your back. The way it works is there are these little air pockets maybe call them uh, bladders. bladders that fill up and they fill up in different like uh, uh, rhythms, right? So you can start at the top and fill up the top one, then go to the middle of the back, then go to the lower back. And that's kind of the waterfall uh, 
massage. You can have them like go off randomly. Uh, you can you know do all kinds of crap. But to me, once I've heard that, I can never unhear it. So I always think that there are these little bladders that are just going, and it doesn't feel great. I think it depends on the company. Some of the older ones, like you couldn't feel at all. I was just in a Mercedes and it was way too strong. But I've never been a big fan of massage either. I always think it's kind of weird. Now so, the one, so whether they put it into one seat or 10, I don't care. The one part about this design, which I think is really not very good. Do you see this little pimple thing? Yeah, the, the little light so, between the lights. So there's this really cool daytime running light down the side of the vehicle. There's one up top and there's one down below. And then there's this weird like little people hole thing in the middle, which continues the light. You know, someone commented why that is actually. I didn't know this. It's because in Korea, they have really strict regulations on how far apart the daytime running lights can extend. Well, once again, the design is that new age design where the light, are, the main headlight projector beam is below what looks like, what looks like the eyes of the vehicle, right? So mm -hmm. they've flipped it around. So instead of having the turn signals and the DLRs on the top, they now have them upside down. Uh, I don't know. You know, the first time I saw that was in the Jeep Cherokee, and people hated it. I think over time, uh, now that more brands are adopting it, people are getting used to it. So here's the thing. Um, basically, what you're referencing is that the turn signals live on top of the headlights. Right. Which, historically, actually, if you look at cars that have done it in the past, is a very kind of... Um, questionable way to do it because there's a lot of examples of this where this did not work. The most infamous example is of course the Pontiac Aztec. That was a car where the turn signals were above the headlights. But some cars it works really well, like the Volkswagen Beetle, the classic Beetle, the turn signals are above but the headlights. But those are kind of mounted on top of the fenders. The G-Wagon, right? same thing. Right, this is not in the fender, it's in the fascia. Yeah, which is what the Aztec pioneered. Right. Um, a lot did, of you know the, did you know the G-Wagon actually, uh, the, the, the little turn signal pops down? Yeah, for pedestrian safety. Pedestrian, yeah, it's pretty cool. The, the Lada Neva had this too, actually, where the turn signals were above the headlights. So I'd be curious if the commenters, if they actually like this look. I think that it certainly has progressed a lot since the Aztec. So one of the first cars to do it was the Jeep Cherokee, the, the pre-refresh one of the KL, which people hated, yeah. by oh, the yeah. way, when they launched yeah, it. because it was leaked, I think, on Jalopnik. And uh, it looked horrible. It was sitting like in the factory somewhere, and it certainly wasn't the first impression you'd want for a new vehicle, especially and with a controversial design language. Very true. They're very true. And yeah, and then of course the refresh Cherokee, they went away from it. I think people didn't like it so much. But now that like Hyundai does it on the Kona, they do it on pretty much every vehicle in their lineup. They've kind of made it a staple of their design, and I think it looks pretty good actually. So, so can I talk about a big sea change in the brand? And we'll let's we can talk about why Kia and Hyundai are killing it right now, but let me talk about a sea change. What do you so, mean a sea change? Well, so a, a sea change means like a, a, a drastic difference between the way it used to be and the way it is now, right? So once upon a time, Kia and Hyundai were uh, the budget brands that came here after the Japanese and established a bulkhead in the US by selling inexpensive vehicles that were built relatively inexpensively, right? And then over the years, the quality got better. And then what their, this is the pre-sea change, uh, kind of claim to fame was, is they would give you more um, amenities, like, you know, at, a, at the same price point. So for those of you guys who aren't in the automobile business, the manufacturers, each and every one of them, benchmark the competition. And so you will find similar trim levels among competing brands at almost similar pricing levels. So when uh, a car company rolls out a car, they'll look at the competition, they'll look at what the... Um, what the features are, and then they'll price it accordingly so that it is either on par with the comp competition or maybe in some ways a little bit less or a little bit more. Did you and, know, I, this is a fun fun little piece of history. I was just talking to the Mercedes guys in Germany about this, yeah. and they don't even buy the competition anymore. Yeah, they, actually, they have No, they have agreements where they, <laughs> when there's a new car, they just drop them off at each other's headquarters. Yeah. So like BMW's like, look, it's a new 5 Series. Here you go, Mercedes. Here's your 5 Series. And then when Mercedes has an E-Class, they're like, look, BMW, this is a new E-Class. Here you have an E-Class. Except, did you know, Mercedes has a whole fleet of other competition, right? Everything from Lucid's to, um, uh, you know, BMW's and whatever. But they don't have a Ram 1500. Yeah, I can see why. Did you know that? Well, because the, and that's why the, <laughs> the Mercedes-Benz X-Class <laughs> went away. Yep, they don't have a Ram 1500. You were joking about it at dinner. I said, so you do have a Ram 1500? And they said, we do not. I'm like, you should get one. And ironically, uh, Mercedes actually built some pretty big trucks. Yeah, they do build some just big not, trucks. Just not, just not pickup, pickup trucks. trucks. 
Yeah. All right, so let me finish what I was saying, okay? So what's going on here is, let's say that you have a, let's talk about the Palisade, right? And you're benchmarking the competition. So in the past, what Kia would do is if the competition didn't offer heated seats, they would offer heated seats at the same price point. That's what they're doing now. No, they're doing more than that now. So th this is where the sea change come in, comes in, right? What is a sea change? Sea change, like you're in a boat and it's calm <laughs> and all of a sudden it gets wavy. Whoa. That's a sea change. You well, never heard that expression? No, I've never heard that's that expression. It's a big expression. It's, it's, an, it's a very common expression. It's like all of a sudden you go from... I don't from, think it does get common. Oh, it is. Why don't you Google just it. say a big change? Why don't you Google it? <laughs> Google sea change. Sea change? Yeah, it's a big... Yeah, that, it, it, it completely changes the, the, the whole everything about what's going on is an English idiomatic expression which denotes a substantial change or in perspective, especially in which affects a group or society at large on a particular issue. Oh, very interesting. Does that make sense now? That makes sense. Okay, so the sea change, or if you want to go the millennial, the big change, maybe, Tommy. Maybe the other one you could use is paradigm shift. No, that's that's a little too obscure. What do you, it's better than sea change. It's, it's self-explanatory. Hey, we're sailing along, and all of a sudden, a storm came up. Wow, that was a big sea change. It got from being calm and cool to being terrifying. And that's what that means, right? So the change is that they used to do this thing where they would you know, give you more features. Now what they're doing is they're not just doing more features, but they're actually like taking it up a class in terms of the interior. So that vehicle that you just had up there for a second, right, the Palisade, is, is not a premium, but uh, you know, a regular uh, three-row SUV or crossover, but the interior looks like it's out of an X7, which is a premium vehicle. So they're putting like premium materials, features into uh, like every, you know, regular cars. Sure. So they're, take, they're taking it and they're not, they're going beyond just like the power seats and massaging seats, but they're actually making it look and feel premium on a car that isn't premium. And I think that is huge. It is huge. Now, there are, so I say it's like an X7 for $30,000 oh, less. When I say premium, it isn't price premium. But um, there are certain things that an X7 does much better. And the primary thing that an X7 or a GLS would do much better than this, and once again, crazy comparison, a Hyundai to a BMW, but um, the powertrain is still pretty underwhelming. Exactly right. The powertrain in this vehicle is just a regular old V6. Right. Whereas in a BMW, you'd have a straight six turbo or a V8 right. twin turbo. So I said the interior. They've changed the interior. They haven't changed the powertrains. And that's the other thing that Hyundai's missing on this model, which all of their competition, even at the price point offers, or not all of it, but a lot of it, is a hybrid offering. So a lot of folks are looking into the Highlander hybrid or the Explorer hybrid, right, which are very, very high-volume vehicles, and Hyundai doesn't currently have an offering to compete. But, look, you, they can sell every one of these that they build. Well, they are, I mean... And there's a wait for them. And pa Palisades are some of the most marked-up vehicles, I think, on the market. Palisades and, and, and Telluride. And Telluride, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, that just is a sign that they've knocked out of the ballpark. Uh, they're built here in America, right, which mm -hmm. is also cool. Uh, and uh, even after the second or refresh generation, there's still a wait for them. They, they're, they're just on fire when it comes to uh, building the cars that people want to buy. So let's talk about that. So wh why, let's dissect this. Why is Hyundai and Kia on fire? And I think the biggest reason that they're on fire is... Uh, that they're providing a lot of value. When we say on fire, we mean doing well, not, yeah. not literally smoldering. No, no, no. no, <laughs> the, no the brand no. is creating a lot of excitement, sales, and product that people want. Yeah, so the first key to that success, I think, is value, right? So, sure, very so you're good getting value. an X7 interior at $50,000. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of that is they are, uh, and I don't know any other brand that does this, they are constantly redesigning and uh, rethinking their cars. So I was just in Korea at their headquarters, and I can't talk about this because they showed me like the next generation of a lot of their new cars, right? And what's amazing, and this is something they've done in the past, is like most vehicles are evolutionary. Uh, in other words, you know, uh, if the previous generation has a big grill, the next generation will have a similar grill, but maybe bigger or smaller, right? It doesn't really change, but Hyundai, Kia like completely redesigned the car. And what the analogy that they used when I was at this presentation is, imagine that their cars are like uh, uh, a chessboard, okay? All the chess pieces, right? So while all of the other competition may be just cranking out pawns and pawns and pawns or bigger versions of a pawn, right? Mm -hmm. Think about Audi, right? That's what they're doing. 
Yep. Or Mercedes, that's what they're doing. They look at the base of that chess piece as being their design language, right? Mm -hmm. And then the top of the pawn is the vehicle. So uh, like a king and a rook and a knight and a queen look nothing alike except that they share the base. So their design language, according to them, is more like a chess piece as opposed to one of those Russian uh, nesting dolls, right? The Matushka dolls, where it's a doll within a doll within a doll. Uh, and I think that's working for them. I think people are really getting tired of having you know, a smaller or a bigger version of their friends' or neighbors' cars. Well, there's a couple things going on, and it's... I'm trying to find this N74 vision that they came up with. Yeah, I was going to talk about that, too. Um, so this is this new concept car. with the, this the, the hottest concept car of the year. I would say that might be, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I'm going to say that's probably the hottest concept car of the decade. Oh. It's just, it's just and, and this one, interestingly, is not only design-wise is it incredible, uh, powertrain-wise it's incredible. So I was there when they unveiled this bad boy, right? Uh, and basically, if you look at it, there's a little bit of DeLorean in it. There's a whole backstory. Uh, which I'm not going to bore you with, but uh, they really took an 80s vehicle uh, and they made it retro cool, and that is hard, but they did more than that, right? Uh, that is a fuel cell powered car, so it, it actually runs not as an electric, oh, fuel cell powered cars are electric cars, but it's powered by hydrogen. And so they were the first brand to take hydrogen and make it a performance car as opposed to an economy car. And that is just thinking so far out of the box that I'm surprised other people haven't done it. I think BMW has done this, and I think some of the other brands have done it, but none of them have had the gumption to actually unroll it as a real concept car that actually they might build. And, and the other thing about Hyundai uh, is they have a reputation of building concept cars that then very quickly become real cars right. that have the same look as the concept car. First of all, the hydrogen idea is terrible. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Sorry. But, but you see what I'm saying when I say it's out of the box, right? It is out of the box. What, the reason I think it's terrible is because, so we started reporting on hydrogen cars like 10 years ago, and I remember 10 years ago there were 40 hydrogen stations. Can I, can I stop you just for a sec and I'll let you continue? C keep in mind, Korea has a hydrogen infrastructure. No, but I'm saying for the U.S., it's a terrible idea because 10 years ago we started reporting on hydrogen cars and there were like 40 hydrogen stations for the first generation Mirai and then the Honda Clarity in California only. And every year they come out and say there's going to be new hydrogen stations expanding on the East Coast and new hydrogen stations in California. And now we're in 2022 and I think there's 48 hydrogen stations. So it's just not expanding at the rate it needs to be to be a feasible technology. Is, is it even expanding? Well, I don't know if it's even expanding at all. I mean, I remember... Two, three years ago, I went to this Toyota Evolution project um, event where they were talking about the, the new Mirai at the time, and they said that they were getting approval on the East Coast, and it was all ready to go, except then they ran into issues with the Department of Transportation where hydrogen was deemed as a dangerous material, and you couldn't drive it over bridges or through tunnels. It was a whole thing. So, so I have an interesting, interesting fact about that. You know Nicola, the company Nicola? Nicola. Nicola, yeah, Nicola. You know Nicola? Yeah, you're thinking of Ricola. Nicola. You know Nicola? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they, 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 they've had a checkered pass to be sure. kind. They had that EV truck, right. which but or the hydrogen truck. They actually truck. this year managed to build something like 50 trucks. Hydrogen, the, but big rigs. Big rigs, yeah, big rigs. And those are hydrogen powered. Sure. Uh, and in that space, hydrogen does seem to be working because you can have hydrogen stations at like depots where, you know, there are large warehouses. Still need to build them. Yeah, but they're out there. So they, they've managed to sell a bunch. And then we were talking to Hyundai. And actually, they also build a hydrogen truck. Uh, big rig, right? Uh, and they're running in Switzerland right now. And I was talking to uh, the guy, one of the engineers, and he said that given the choice between driving a hydrogen-powered um, semi-truck or a diesel one, the drivers will always choose the hydrogen vehicle. It's great technology. It's fantastic technology. You, know why, you want to know why? Because they're smooth and fast and, and easy quiet. to drive. And yeah. And, and they don't feel as stressed out driving. So if that is true for a semi-truck, why wouldn't that be true for a car? Because the infrastructure is not there. Forget about the infrastructure. I'm asking you if that is true for a pickup truck. Can't forget about the infrastructure because I need to fill it up. Um, it's a good technology. The issue with hydrogen, quite honestly, Dad, is that most hydrogen comes from natural gas. Um, and then you're creating, you're using natural gas to create hydrogen and then hydrogen to create electricity. Why not just make electricity from windmills and use that to power your car? Uh, because hydrogen potentially doesn't have that issue when you're towing big rig again where you know it zaps so because look look our lightning has 130 
one kilowatt hour battery, which is the equivalent of four gallons of gas. So if it tows 100 miles with you know 6,000 pounds, that's pretty impressive. But with hydrogen, you can actually do that in an electric vehicle and then fill it up and keep driving. Or yeah. just an electric vehicle, you you know, I just spent. 16 hours charging in Dead Horse, Alaska, trying to get the truck to 90% so I could drive it back down to Fairbanks. It's a great idea. I, I love hydrogen. I've driven a bunch of cars. Big supporter of it. Few issues, though, I mean, other than infrastructure, is it's very expensive. Um, so when you, so currently, if you go buy like a new Mirai, they actually give you a little credit card that works for up to fifteen thousand dollars worth of free hydrogen, which is amazing. But when you go to fill up a hydrogen car, it's going to be eighty, hundred bucks. Are, you are absolutely correct. And if you look at the values of the previous generation Mirai in California. Yeah, they're nothing. Which were like $69,000, if I recall. Yeah. You can buy those things for $7,000 all the along. Yeah, and new, I mean, it's also very expensive technology. Now, one concern people have is that it's very unsafe. I don't buy that at all because these companies do oh, huge. Hindenburg, right? Right. These companies do an enormous amount of testing, though, to, to make sure that the tanks are safe. And they even do stuff like shoot them with bullets to make sure they won't all right, explode. All right, let me ask you this, though. Why so, do you keep interrupting me? Okay. You're in a big role here. <sighs> Because right, uh, yeah, we've had this conversation. Well, it's interesting. These are these are things that the people want to know. I thought we were talking about the brands that are, you know, killing it, and those that are being killed. And at the rate we're going, we're going to be. We've been doing this almost a half hour, and we've just talked about one brand. But it's free form. This is how the new podcasts are. I'll have you know. Well, I just don't want to disappoint our viewers and listeners. You know, the ones they probably want to hear about are the ones that are struggling. So well, we've, th- we've just gotten through one brand. The other thing I do want to talk about Hyundai and Kia. And this is a good and a bad thing. So you talk about how they kind of reshape and redesign their yes. brand every model cycle. Yes. The issue with that is, though, if you like a 3 Series from 2003, the one from 2009, the one from 2015 are all going to look pretty similar. Um, they've got very distinct lineation that, that kind of um, establishes the brand identity. If you look at a Sonata from 2004 compared to 2010, compared to 2015, compared to 2022, Every generation Sonata looks totally different. So, so if you like the current Sonata, the next one's going to look entirely different than the current one. So what are you saying? Well, I'm saying it's a good and a bad thing. I mean, it's hard to perhaps have that same brand loyalty um, if, if every car looks like it's entirely different than the one it replaces. Have like, you, there's a reason that the Mustang kind of looks like the previous Mustang, which so, kind of looks like the so previous Mustang. The only analogy I can think of is, have you heard of the artist called Pollock? I think it's Andrew Pollock. I am not really an art guy. Okay. But yes, I, I do so have he, heard of him. He, he's the guy who like splatters paint, you know, on giant canvases and it looks like somebody just took a paintbrush and which he did, right? And yeah. splattered paint. Now, if you look at his earlier work, right, there, it's very realistic. And artists in general have this um, maturity, I guess, or uh, growth where they start doing one thing and by the end of their lives they might be doing something else, right? Sure. So if you look at an early Pollock. Uh, it looks just like a very realistic uh, painting of, you know, a, a landscape. But by the end of it, it's like dots on a... On a but that doesn't mean that the earlier paint, pa- Pollock, 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 Pollock? Uh, Pollock is worth any less than the later one, right? Just because there's this progression doesn't make it less valuable. In fact, in some ways, it makes it more valuable because then some model years are going to be more sought after and they'll be very distinct versus being the same thing but in you know a smaller or bigger version of it. My concern, though, is that Van Gogh painted a bunch of different things over right. a bunch of different years. But there was very clearly a style that was associated with Van Gogh. If, you can, if, if you looked at an early Pollock and compared it to a new, you would not see the style. Right, which I think is bad. Okay. Like a Van Gogh, you look at a late Van Gogh, and he might be a completely different picture than an early one, but there's still a connection. If you but look, it's still a Van Gogh. Yeah, but that's why I think it's exceptionally valuable is because people know and expect that one style. Whereas with Hyundai right now, if you like the Ionic 5, the next one may be entirely different. And we see that with the Ionic 6. It's one of my, I think the Ionic 6 is a good looking car. I think the Ionic 5 is exceptional. But there's almost nothing that correlates the them. Base of the, the base of the... But you can't see that. No, so, so I'll tell you what they would say. I, I had a long conversation with designer. It's in this car too. You see the little pixel headlights. Right. Those pixels are in both the Ionic Five and the Ionic Six, and of course in this vehicle. Now as well. this N seventy four looks just like an Ionic Five. I think I do see the brand symbol because you got the squared off pixelated headlights. You got the very square design language. The Ionic Six looks like a bar of soap, which is great. I think it's fantastic. It's super swoopy and it's got that big spoiler on the end version, but it doesn't look like this. It doesn't okay, look like an Ionic Five. Okay, car. let me ask you this question. I know you don't like the hydrogen powertrain. 
What if you put a big old V8? I mean, just forget about that. How about if you put a big old V8 in there or a big old battery? Oh. It's just an incredible design. You could power this by a three-cylinder, and I think it'd be amazing. Right. I, I think it's a beautiful car. I really hope to build it. I just, in the U.S., the hydrogen thing is such a hard... I mean, hydrogen would be an enormously successful uh, plan if a company like Hyundai said, we're going to put $3 billion behind infrastructure, and we're going to build out the network just like Tesla did with the supercharger network. But it would take someone like Hyundai or Kia or Ford or BMW or whoever to do that, because currently it's just not evolving. It's just not moving. And BMW recently announced, by the way, that they're also going to build a hydrogen-powered car for where there's no charging infrastructure. Which is great. And I, I'm, I'm just being very selfish because I'm an American in America. Uh, but I do think that needs to happen. BMW, by the way, has explored hydrogen in the past. This is not the first time they're doing it. Um, so look, I think... Look, I think a, the one thing we have learned from our trip to Alaska in the Lightning, right, is that at least, uh, I think 50% is being generous, but let's just go with that. Uh, people do not want electric cars. They sure. Just, they just don't want them. Well, but part of that they, is they because want... it's become weirdly politicized. Right. But still, it is what it is, right? Whether it's because of politicization or because of environmental issues, it doesn't at the end of the day matter. And you're going to have a hard time selling uh, electric cars to those people. So you're going to have to give them an alternative. And that alternative could be uh, hydrogen. It could be uh, synthetic fuels, right? There's a lot of different sure. alternatives. Uh, but if half the market wants nothing, and I mean this is militantly wants nothing to do with electric cars, then you're going to have to, as a ma as a brand, as a manufacturer, figure out how to sell stuff to those well, people. Well, I mean the question I have. First of all, I do want to also clarify: you can make hydrogen from renewable resources too. Sure. It's just you can make it from harder, more expensive typically. Um, but wind, wind, yep, solar. Well, you know, basically you make electricity to make hydrogen to turn back into electricity. Well, hydrogen is the most. It's the most naturally abundant occurring element in the universe, but it's ridiculously hard to bottle, <laughs> basically. And, and the upside to it is, you know, water comes out of it. Sure, yeah. You, so you create water, H2O, and you mix hydrogen with oxygen in the air. And then, of course, that process makes electricity. No, I love the hydrogen thing. But so this militant hate toward EVs, right, which we're seeing a lot of. Do you think that this happened at the turn of the century in the early 1900s? No, because there wasn't social media. Yeah, you don't think, but you you got to figure there was a big sector of the public that was so anti horseless carriage. They were like, I've been riding horses for the last 80 years. I'm not getting rid of no, this but, horse. No, uh, but, you know, I, I read the comments and it's almost become like militant. Like, it's almost become like you'll take my Hemi powered V8 from my cold, dead hands at this point without ever trying or acknowledging the fact that maybe there is a use case for electricity. So those people are so dead set against it because uh, they're listening to uh, only one side of the conversation, right? So here, right, I'm gonna go on a little bit of a Roman rant, right? If that's okay, please. <laughs> sure. All right, so, so here's what's happened, right? When I was a journalist uh, in graduate school and a TV reporter and a newspaper reporter, you were taught that the idea of good reporting was to challenge your audience. So you would go and you would challenge them. You would not take a stand. So you would not be like, hey, I think this is good. I think this is bad. You would just present them with the facts and challenge them with new information that they hadn't heard and then let them make up their mind. The problem with that is social media has completely changed that to the exact opposite. So the worst thing you can do back then was preach to the choir, right? The best thing you can do right now is preach to the choir. So what people are looking for are media outlets that confirm their beliefs. Whether those beliefs are true or not is irrelevant. In other words, you will make a lot more money and you will get a lot more engagement by preaching to the choir as opposed to actually presenting facts or challenging the choir. Uh, and that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. terrifying because uh, what you're in a situation now, with at least with electric cars, are where there is a lot of benefits to electrification. I'm not even talking about like whether you believe it's green or not, but because a lot of people feel like um, they are being forced to adopt the, the technology, which is... Once again, this this constant drumbeat from the people that they're listening to that, you know, they're going to take your V8 away from you, which isn't happening as far as I can tell. You can still go out and buy a Hellcat, right? Uh, then, then people, you know, don't like that fact, and they don't want to give the electric vehicle a chance, even though if you show up with an electric lightning like we did at the drag strip, you're going to blow, blow off the doors of most high-performance cars out there. Well... Right. I mean, that's the that's that's a clearest example of I can give you that the technology is actually better. We just did a tug of war video, and I'm not going to tell you what happened, but we tugged, 
uh, you know, to see which has better performance. We took the Lightning and hooked it up to the hybrid Ford F-150, and then the winner of that uh, took on the uh, Ram Cummins. So you'll see what happened in that. It's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I mean... Once again, though, we're we're already following this trap that that electric is better. I'm not saying it's better. I'm, because, just, I'm, I'm not saying it's because better. who's first of all, no one's bringing their lightning to the drag strip. It's a pickup truck. I'm not. I'm, look, but, I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying listen to the other side and try it before you decide that it's not that it's the devil. But we also need to also talk about the opposite side of what we're talking about, which is the fact that Andre's about to go on a towing road trip with that F-150 Lightning, and it sounds like an absolute miserable idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's so a lot if, of advantages so, so, to so, internal combustion. So, Tommy, let's, let's, let's talk about that. If we were preaching, if we're actually, like some people accuse us of doing, if we were preaching to the choir, if we were pushing the technology, then this video that Andre's about to do where he's going to struggle to go 100 miles towing, you know, a 9,000-pound load is a video we would never produce. Yeah. We, we would, right. right. We would be like all the other EV channels and, you know, bow down at the feet of Mr. Musk, you know, and preach the choir of electrification to all of the, the Tesla Rati out there, right? We wouldn't be doing this video, which is going to be painful to watch. It's going to be painful to do. I'm worried about Andre. So that's what I mean. You know, we're following that old, and the way I was, you know, taught, where we're challenging our audience. The problem is at some point the audience is going to be like, hey, I don't like what you're saying. So all the Tesla people are not going to watch this video because they don't want to see the fact that a Lightning is going to have a hard time towing 100 miles. Or the diesel people are not going to watch a video where the Lightning does well. Anyways, going back to brands that are killing it. So we talked about Hyundai and Kia. Think Ford. We, I think we got that one off our list. Ford. What's another? Ford. Please, let me finish my sentences. Please. <laughs> um, so you think Ford is killing it? What do you think? I think that Ford is doing really well. I think they are giving the folks what they want um, and really coming up with not only products that, that should do well on paper, but also products that push the bounds of what people think they want. So, for example, like the Bronco, they delivered exactly what they needed to deliver, which was a hardcore off-roader with removable roof and doors that come off in this retro design. But then they also came up with this Maverick, which was this little cheap, affordable truck that, oh, by the way, it's a hybrid. And that's, I think, something that people didn't really consider in that class, but is a big selling point. So, yeah, Ford, I think, is... For the most part, there's some there's some questionable vehicles in the lineup which I don't like, but for the most part, it's really doing an incredible job. Look, look, out of their biggest vehicles, they're sold out. So you can go down the line, right? Raptor, sold out. Raptor R, sold out. Maverick, sold out for the next year, right? Maverick, uh, uh, whether you get the base one or whether you get the all-wheel drive um, turbo uh, hybrid, right? Yeah. It's the other way. Anyway, sold out. Maverick, sold out. Bronco, sold out. Bronco Sport, sold out. Well, uh, I'm, keep, Lightning, keep sold, part, sold out. Part of this is also chip shortages, too. Uh, but for the most part, like, for example, they just revealed this um, last week, if you're listening to this on Monday. But this is the new Ford Bronco Heritage Edition. Beautiful car. And it's incredible. It's exactly what people wanted. It's an old-school-looking Bronco with a white roof and white wheels and a white grill and old Bronco script along the side. Incredible. They just knocked it out of the park in every way. You know, I think what happens is, you know... Like anything in life, car companies ebb and wane, right? So there comes a moment where it all comes together, whether it's the management, whether it's the engineering, whether it's the design department, but they all start like hitting on all eight cylinders, right? Where they're just, they're just like in touch with, um, and this is, I think, the other key. Remember I said one of the keys was um, building, you know, affordability. The other key is uh, listening to your customers, right? Yeah. N knowing where the wind is blowing from. And Ford is certainly right now uh, exactly where their customers are, right? That Bronco that you put up there it just looks incredible. Like, th And it's not hard to do, right? Throw some steel wheels on it, give it a white fascia and a white roof. Not hard to do. Yeah. No, I think they're really cool. There's certain, like, I don't like the Escape very much. The new Escape I don't think is a very good. And I don't think the P-Hev Escape especially is very good, the plug-in hybrid. Uh, but if you look at their truck lineup, um, the Lightning is probably one of the best trucks I think you can buy ever. Um, the the Power Boost Hybrid gives people exactly what they wanted. Their heavy duties are a little old, but hopefully in for a refresh pretty soon. The Maverick's incredible. The Ranger, we don't know what the new one is, but it's probably going to be pretty cool. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like every car they come up with creates a lot of excitement in, in the industry, creates a lot of excitement in the brand, and is, as you mentioned, sold out or marked up a huge amount. So they're really killing it. The only thing which I think they should be doing better with the Bronco is just like cranking them out like Tic Tacs, like build as many as you possibly can. There was a study that came out this week also 
uh, that basically looked at what the dealerships are doing to the brands. And finally, we've got like empirical data showing that because of all the crazy dealer markups, market adjustments, it's really not only hurting the reputation of dealerships, but it's also hurting the reputations of the brand. And I think one of the one one of the companies that suffers from this the most because they're so po and it's simply put because their vehicles are the most popular is Ford, right? Uh, all the dealer shenanigans where you know customers are ordering Lightnings for price of X, and then dealer says it's in, and they show up, and it's ten or twenty thousand dollars more than they what they ordered for. Uh, that's just bait and switch Tommy that, that that is that is that is no longer a, a dealership taking advantage of the market condition right if I go online and configure a vehicle and the vehicle costs fifty thousand dollars and then I wait for a year and I get to the dealership and it's seventy thousand dollars that's just uh, uh, the worst form of uh, predatory uh, capitalism uh, and I, I think any dealer uh, that's doing that uh, is not only hurting the reputation of themselves, but hurting the reputation of Ford. And I think none of the brands have taken this seriously enough. Uh, I think, I think once again, this is where Ford uh, is, and so is GM, is, is, is tone deaf, because there is such pure and white and red hot anger that I'm feeling right now toward dealerships because of this. And that anger will come out at some point. Well, and it will be taken out on the brands as well. You have heard Farley's new plan about electrifications and being sold to consumers directly, right? right. So I, I, it's I, already I, happening. It's already seeing a shift in, in, even in the old school OEMs. So I, I, would say, I would say dealers at this point, the damage is done. You guys, uh, if you've been doing this um, in the next 10 years, you know, you, you may... You're, you're living on borrowed time and, and certainly skating on thin ice, but you did this to yourself. I, I think the damage Not is Not all done. dealers. All, there's no. a lot of dealers that were doing a really good job managing. The, the problem is that one bad dealer takes down the whole yeah. deal, right? It's like, you know what? It, it's like, like, here's what I hate. Like there, There's a certain YouTuber out there who preaches to the choir, uh, and you know what I'm talking about, most clickbaity headlines. I don't want to like, I don't want to take a pop at people, but you know, you know, obviously does the preaching of the choir the best and what people hear is this youtuber will be like don't buy anything but this brand and people will be out there be like oh i remember i had a ford 15 years ago and you know it uh, broke down on me you're absolutely right because you're confirming the prejudices that people have unfortunately with the dealership model that we're seeing right now these aren't prejudices these are like real life examples anyway you know i wish like the good dealers uh, could save this because there are some great dealers out there johnson's is one of them the ones where we buy our cars from and there's a lot of dealers who won't sell over sticker so uh you know th they're fighting a good fight but it's 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 hard anyway i think what's the next brand you put up a car yeah um i think mercedes is actually doing a really good job right now they're on a roll they've really upped their quality from where it was even a few years ago they're offering a lot of luxury but kind of old school built like a tank mercedes luxury is coming back in a big way um, their lineup is very diverse. You can get everything from this little squared off Mercedes GLB, which is a great little car, to an S-Class, to a G-Wagon, to electrified models. So a lot of excitement in the Mercedes brand as well. And overall, they're really doing a lot of in innovative designs and a lot of some of the best interiors, I think, in the industry. Yeah, I mean, that uh, QXX that you went and drove. EQXX. Has, EQXX that has, what, 700 miles of range? Yeah, well, it's only a, a prototype right now. It's not It's not actually a production vehicle. But they're kind of showcasing some of their future technologies. And every vehicle they come out with, for the most part, is very, very good. Uh, if you go back a few years, there were some kind of question model, like the first generation GLA wasn't very good. You go back even before that. And in the early 2000s, I think they were in a really bad place with quality. But recently, they've stepped it up in a huge way and are making a big comeback. So um, do you, is there any others you want to mention as just killing it? Well, I want to talk about one which I think is struggling a little bit. Be be can, I, can I pick my struggle? Oh, go for yeah, it. Well, no, you can go. So this is going to be uh, unexpected, I think, but I think the brand that's actually in trouble and doesn't know it yet is Tesla. Why is that? A couple of factors. First of all, uh, all the other manufacturers are now you know, hot on their heels. So for the longest time, if you thought of an electric vehicle, it was Tesla, right? But the biggest reason is I think that new product is the lifeblood of any car company. Uh, and Tesla has been getting away with having no new product for way too long. And I think that's because people are still curious as to what an electric car is. So when they're thinking about an electric car, then they think of Tesla. So their market 
is is not yet you know like if you want an Audi you've probably driven an Audi you probably know what an Audi is same thing with BMW GM right but most people have not owned Teslas only four percent of America has become electrified or has owned electric vehicle and these guys have no new product they have they have done some refreshes which have been pretty interesting the model s you have up there that's yeah. a 12 year old car but what Tesla's is really good at is keeping their cars kind of at the top of people's interest level because they really still push the boundaries so for example i don't know if that's that might be a plaid but like the plaid was a good example where they were able to put a lot of interest in a car that like you said is basically 10 12 years old with the model s uh, 2012 so it's I 10 think, years old i think they actually got that one wrong the plaid yeah why I is that because i think they should have made it like distinctly different from a regular model s so initially when that came out and once again i'm going to use the only metric that i think is the most important which is supply and demand right demand to me suggests that they got it right so when the, when the plaid first came out you had to wait i remember i was looking at them we weren't going to buy one they're way too expensive but i was looking at them and like if you ordered it right away you could get it within two weeks and then as it got closer to actually going into production that two weeks became two months and then that became three months and six months but i bet you if you wanted a plaid right now you could probably get one within a week part of that though that is that they're really good at just cranking cars out the door and yes. kind of getting people the cars that they ordered that's one of tesla's big things so i think there's still a lot of demand for teslas um i think some of the pricing is getting a little expensive but i i don't know i i think i agree with you about a lot of what you said about having fresh product in the the, 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 the lineup. And, and the biggest miss, Tommy, is uh, the Cybertruck. So I was at the launch of the Cybertruck. There was so much excitement. But because of, I think, just the um, COVID and supply shortages and all that, uh, they really went from being a leader in the electric truck world to now being a follower, right? By the time that it's been postponed, I think, two years now, maybe it's going to be three years by the time it actually hits the market. And by that point, you know, Rivian's going to be out there selling trucks. Ford's going to be out there selling trucks. Uh, GMC, that's another problem. That I, 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 w I was going to say they're going to be selling Hummer EVs, but as far as I know, uh, they're in. I don't, I don't know what's happening with Hummer EVs. Those things were supposed to be built last year at this time, and a year later they've built literally, and, and I think I'm not wrong about this, less than a thousand of them. That is not what GM does. So another company, which I think is probably not as strong as they once were, is BMW. I think they're in trouble. Well, BMW, well, I don't want to say that. Uh, but BMW used to be the ultimate driver's car, right? The ultimate driving machine was their slogan. And they had, um, there was like Mercedes for the luxury oriented, BMW for the driving oriented. And I think that they kind of tried to cross a little bit into the, the luxe side of the things. And they got a little weird with some of their design languages. And some of their cars are really good. So I actually think their SUVs are some of the best in class. So X5 is incredible x7 is really really good but a lot of their traditional offerings just aren't all that attractive to me so the three series the five series um they're they're just not what they once were and then they have just way too many products which i think don't fill the right void so you've got an x1 and an x2 which to me seem like they're competing against each other i know they tell you there's differences in the body shape but they're too similar x3 good car x4 worst x3 um so there's there's some kind of weirdness there some of their new electrified stuff is actually very good so the i4 is a really good car that's basically an electrified four series grand coupe it shouldn't be as good as it is because it's kind of a return to the old school driving focus bmws in the world of evs and then the ix i think is also very good the new suv but once again they've gotten so weird with some of the design language i think they're putting some customers off so i couldn't agree with you more i think they're in trouble and let me give kind of voice and maybe more specificity to what you said, okay? Uh, so I think BMW has fallen into this trap of wanting to be all things to all people. Mm. At one moment in history, you knew exactly what you were getting with the BMW, right? You were getting uh, a really great driving sedan. And then you were getting a really great driving sedan and crossover. But now they're trying to be everything to everybody. So when you try to do that, and you try to get this wide bandwidth of characteristics in your car so what i mean by that is when you're trying to be both and we just drove a whole bunch of the m cars right and the thing that to me doesn't work in them is either be sporty or be luxurious but don't try to be both and so they're trying to cram too much uh into every car trying to become uh, a thing that that they probably shouldn't be so make that car sporty uh, and make it fast and make it quick, but don't make it luxurious or don't make it electric or don't make it a convertible uh, or don't make it a crossover. Uh, have it be, you know, like like a like a single focus laser and people will buy it for what it does. When you try to put too many of those things, you end up with these cars that basically are heavy, right? And when you build a heavy car, 
then you're not building a sports car anymore. Yeah, that's true. So that, that's, I think, where they're really struggling. So th they need to refocus on what a BMW brand value is, what their core DNA is, and, and start building very high performance, very specifically tuned. And, and look, you, look, Porsche does really well selling cars that don't work. Like the 911 is the best case scenario there, right? That car has only one use case, which is you know, driving it quickly down a road with two people in it. It, do, it right. has no utility. Oh, yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? And yet, you can't buy 911 right now. Right. So another brand which I think is probably a very hit and miss on their products is General Motors just as a company. So General Motors has some really core products which are some of the best in class, if not the best Corvette. in class. So C8 Corvette's incredible, great value. It's a Ferrari beater for a quarter of the price. Best Corvette I think they've probably ever done. Full-size trucks, really, really good. I think the Silverado and the Sierras and the HD class is really top of the notch. And then they have a full line of kind of generic SUVs which just don't move the needle at all and really struggle to compete in the class. Vehicles like the Traverse. It's just, we were just looking at the Palisade. Compared to the Palisade, this doesn't look as good. The interior is not as nice. The value just qu isn't quite there. Um, same thing with the Equinox, right? There's just no compelling reason to buy an Equinox so, over like a RAV4. So, so I, I think the problem with GM right now is they're stuck in like old thinking, right? Uh, they're stuck in like the thinking from the 80s or 90s where it was all marketing. When I say marketing, think dealership driven, right? And I think the best example of that is the Blazer. To me, that is just a cynical use of a really classic name to sell cars, right? So what you could have done when you built the Blazer was you could have made it a really good off-roader to rival the Bronco and the Wrangler. But instead, they built another version of just a plain Jane crossover. And then instead of actually honoring the blazer name what they did was said in a cynical way i think hey slap the blazer name on it people know that and they'll buy it just because of the blazer name not because of what that represents having said that it does sell quite well i'm um, sure it does. i'm sure that works people do like it. it it actually is a pretty attractive thing i would have called it like the camaro suv because that's clearly what they were going for a kind of sporty that's, that's suv that's not a blazer tommy that's a mid-size crossover but we're also in 2022 right and the definition of what some of the stuff means may, may change to some people if they had built a blazer that competes with the bronco which it did back in the day right, right. then there would be a line of people out the door they i would, agree they'd they, be generating interest instead you've got this kind of lukewarm crossover they, they with, like, with an iconic name they shouldn't have used the blazer name on this i think that this is a good SUV, call it the Camaro whatever, lift back. Um, but uh, it's still a good car, but you're right. They should not have used a Blazer name on it. And then they've also certain models which are very, very good, but are just so limited production. Like the CT5 Blackwing, they put this enormous amount of work into this engine, and then they only build a few hundred of them. And you're like, what? what's this kind of a waste, wasn't it? It's like the old CTSV wagon, the same thing. So, so for me, when I go cover a new car reveal, right, uh, you can always tell like how much innovation is in the car, how much engineering prowess is in the car by, you know, what the headline is. So I just went to the Lyric, right? Uh, and the Lyric is sold out. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I'm arguing against myself here. But one of the things that GM or Cadillac focused on when they unveiled it is that Lyric is going to have exclusively, at least for now, new switch gear. So if the headline is Cadillac builds a car with unique switch gear, that's, you know, I'll leave that up to you guys to decide whether you think that shows off the company's prowess. And that's what I mean. It's, it's, it, you can see kind of the thinking behind the product with the blazer, with the switch gear, right? It, it's not about like, hey, let's go for the moonshot and let's listen to our customers and see what they're saying. Let's, let's use what we used to know and how we sold cars, right? Because this is how cars were sold. My dad, when your grandpa, when I was young, he would, every year he would go to this prime rib party at the local dealership where they would unveil the new Cadillac, right? Right. And there was like, there was, now there's chrome over here. And, you know, yeah. now we've moved the turn signal up here, right? And now we're using Corinthian leather and blah, blah, blah. And this, to me, is the kind of thinking that GM is stuck in as opposed to, think, you know, listening to their customers who want something that is an expression of who they are and want something that is no longer just another cookie-cutter vehicle, but something that... that has more than unique switch gear. There are a couple things which I'm excited about. The um, new Colorado and Canyon look very good. I think they really did a good job with those trucks. Totally agree. And then the new Blazer EV actually I think is a pretty cool looking little thing. I'm really excited to see what that's like, especially. That's actually really, it does look good. In SS form, I think that's going to be very, very cool. So 
Um, it's GM, General Motors is very hit and miss with me. You've got certain vehicles like the Acadia, like the Terrain from GMC, which just don't move the needle at all for me. you got other stuff like the uh, Corvette, like the full-size trucks, like the, even the mid-size trucks now, which I think are phenomenal and really some of the best in the industry. Another good one is the, 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 the big SUVs, the Tahoe, Suburban, um, Outstanding. Yukon, Escalade, all really good. You, you know, once upon a time when we built cars, we owned luxury, right? And I say we, I mean America. And then the Germans came and took luxury from us. And then during the oil crisis, the Japanese snuck in and took economy from us. The one thing we can still build are trucks and big SUVs. And GM is certainly the leader in big SUVs. So those, those triplets, right, Tahoe, Yukon, Escalade, are just some of the best of the breed. So this is a brand which I wanted to get your opinion on. How do you think Toyota's up is doing? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot to unpack with Toyota. I feel like Toyota's kind of always right down the middle. They never do anything that... They're never like in a phase where I'm like, wow, Toyota's absolutely killing it in every product, but they're never in a phase where I'm like, wow, Toyota's kind of falling behind, except with electrification, Bob, maybe a little bit. So the, you know, the news in the last two weeks, which was stunning, was that they were actually forced back to buy back, or they offered... That manufacturers never buy back cars. They didn't sell a lot of them. I want to say it's in the hundreds. But they were forced to buy back the uh, BZ4X so, because the wheels were falling off? Yeah, it was like a stud issue. I think... Well, well don't, don't just... Hold on, hold on. Don't just gloss over that. No, I'm, Toyota, I'm, that's known for reliability, I'm built an electric to, car where the wheels are falling off? I'm about to talk about it because they weren't forced to buy them back. It was either a recall or they offered a buyback. But companies never... That, that is extraordinary. Companies never buy back cars, Tommy, and especially not... On a think about that, the company whose reputation is based on reliability literally built cars where the wheels are falling off. We don't. I don't. Yes, but how many? I mean, what's the extent? I mean, they only sold, like you said, a couple hundred of BZ4X. All it takes is one to, to to sink your reputation, unfortunately. So so let's say that's an outlier. Okay. I mean, you could say the same thing about Hyundai, right? Hyundai has had a lot of issues with certain engine models. Um, grenading themselves, right? And Ford with the Bronco. Right. Everybody has recall issues. It's not just a, a Toyota thing. But the but a company whose DNA is reliability. That you know, Ford's Ford's DNA is not reliability, right? Fix it. Uh, fix. No, that's found on, on road, road dead. dead. Yeah, that is not. You know, it's like Fiat, right? Fix it again, Tony. That's where I was going with that. Uh, you know, this is not. But Toyota, gosh, that is reliability. So there's a lot to unpack. World's biggest car company. You know. Uh, build um, build some incredible vehicles. Uh, they're just like they just kind of just chug along, doing what they do. Uh, you know, notching up sale after sale. Um, so I, I don't know where Toyota's at. I think they're just kind of like you said, down the middle. Yeah, but they've always been down the middle. I remember when we started this industry in 2012, there was not like a single product that was like, wow, or 2009 actually. There was not a single product that was like, wow, but there was also not a single product where it was like, ugh. So they. They seem, for the most part, to kind of do consistently good cars that are never leading the competition in technology, never really falling too far behind so in technology. I, I am really excited by the GR Corolla. Sure. I think that is, you know, 300 horsepower out of a three-cylinder uh, is incredible. So I can't wait to go drive that. We're going to go drive that pretty soon. So that's very innovative uh, and really cool. Um, then there are some cars I am, you know, like not excited about at all uh, from Toyota, which, you know, is is the regular Corolla, for instance. It's, it's a, you know, a middle-of-the-road hatchback. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a strange company. I think they're very conservative, uh, and so they'll never be out there uh, breaking new ground. They did it with the Synergy Drive, of course, right? Yeah, um, yeah, the hybrid system in the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah their hybrid system. But uh, since then, you know, I'd love to see a little bit more innovation. So this, this is a company that's that's coming back in a big way. They were in a really low spot for a bunch of years yeah, thanks definitely, to definitely coming back. Um, certain leaders in the, the high end of the company. Carlos Ghosn, you mean? I'm not saying exclusively because Carlos, but I think that was no, a big... No, he cut... Look, what he did was the worst thing you can do to a car company. He came and saved Nissan, and then he, you know, he was... He was an, a, a, a cost-cutting uh, CEO who cared about the bottom line and the lifeblood of any car company is new product. And because of his cost-cutting, they ran out of new product and people stopped buying Nissans. Well, it's that simple. and the products they did have, I think, were also pretty underwhelming. 
Well, they for got a long all, time. well, because you're not putting any money into research and development. You're just, you know, cut here, cut there, cut there. And next thing you know, you've got old cars. But the company is coming back in a big way. So, of course, talking about Nissan, we're looking at a picture of the brand new Z, which is a very compelling car at a pretty good value, I think. But beyond just the Z, which is going to be a pretty low volume it. car. Love the Z. Yep, we got other models. New, pa uh, new Frontier, quite good. Pathfinder, good. Good, Pathfinder's good. I think the new Rogue is way better than the old Rogue. So, for the most part... We, we, we have it here. I know, it's got the new turbo engine. For the most part, I think that this company is really starting to have a big comeback, and it's good to see Nissan back on, on its feet. Um, I mean, if you go back five, ten years ago, like the Rogue was pretty dreary to drive, the Ultima pretty dreary to drive, the Pathfinder really dreary to drive. So they killed the Maxima this week. What do you think of that? That's fine to me. You don't care? No, because once again, that was a car that really drove innovation back, um, go back even 30, 40 years. It was really innovative. And then for a lot of years, they just kind of got along, and by the end of the run, it, it, I mean, it, you sp it looked sporty, it looked cool, but it didn't have any of the chops to really back it up. So that's not one that I'm going to miss too much. So we're, I'm really curious to see how the Ari is going to do. A little curious if that's going to be competitive in the electric market. But apart from that, I think Nissan's really doing pretty good. Do you think that the Titan will survive, Tommy? No. You think the Titan? No, no. That, that's, I think every, it's gonna, every year there's rumor that the it, Titan's going away, and then every year it keeps soldiering on. I think it's going to make it through 2024, and then beyond that, I hey, doubt hey, it. Uh, hey, let's talk about what we're, at Nissan. Let's talk about the series that we're doing. Okay. Uh, that's coming up. And we're doing a bunch of videos over at TFL Car or alltfl.com where uh, we're buying three convertibles from the 90s because I think the 90s are, I think the 80s are done. I think we're moving on to the 90s now in terms of retro cool. Uh, and uh, we bought uh, a Mercedes Benz 500 SL and we bought a Nissan, this is weird, uh, 300ZX convertible, which you told me was the most expensive. Uh, of the Nissan lineup. I would have thought it would have been the twin turbo. Yeah, right. And then uh, we're trying to find... When it was originally. Trying to find a Corvette. Yeah, now they're worth nothing. But we're trying to find a Corvette as well from the 90s, and we'll do a pretty cool little shootout. So I think we should get Nathan to drive the Corvette. Yep. I'll drive the, the Z, mm -hmm. and then we'll put Andre in the Mercedes. Yeah, it'll be cool. And we're going to have a bunch of challenges, uh, including, I think, a drag race. Yeah, and we'll see which one craps out first. All right, you got Honda up there. What do you think of Honda? So Honda's a company which I don't think is in their high point right now. This is a company historically been very engineering driven, very motivated, and very. Um, well, um, I think the issue with Honda is uh, they've been extremely focused on building really good engines, not motors. Right, an engine is internal combustion, a motor is electric, and that's the problem. We're we're going through this time where we're switching from the internal combustion engine. Uh, to the electric motor, and I think Honda is really having a hard time finding their footing, switching from one to the other. And, and you know, they did the Clarity, which was their first electric car. It was not good. It, it only had like 80 miles of range. Right. Styling was, you know. Not their, f I think they actually did one in the 90s, believe it or not. Yeah, they it did It was like one, a yeah, yeah. weird kind of little lease only so, thing. So I think they're kind of, they're kind of, you know, struggling trying to find their foothold, but they're trying. So like, you're showing me the new, um, or the old Pilot, right? No. That's that's a first, that's another issue. He's talking about the design language. Oh, is that the, that's the problem. So is that the CRV? That's a brand new CRV. CRV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you, I, I, but you know what? If you put up the RAV4 and remove the badges, even I would have a hard time telling them apart. Right. Um, I think that they're being a little too conservative on where they're pushing the ball. Um, certain products are pretty good, like the Civic. I think is really quite good. I'm not on board with the HRV very much. I don't think the new HRV is all that attractive to me. CRV. I think the new one actually looks quite good. Pilot is in need of a refresh. Passport is good. So it's kind of hit and miss with Honda. And yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to see them really push toward electrification because they don't have a lot of electrified offerings. So forget about electrification. How about just innovation, right? So remember that when the first CRV came out, it was this kind of really wacky but interesting uh, crossover where there was like a little picnic table in the back. You remember yeah. that? Yeah, you know what else had a picnic table? What? The Aztec. Right, I had a picnic table, but I was just at the uh, first drive of the new CRV, uh, and that video is coming up soon. I did a walk around of the hybrid, but you know they made it a little bit bigger. Uh, but what's the headline, Tommy? That's the hard part. What's, they made it a little bigger. What's the headline? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and actually, I think in the hybrid they actually reduced the horsepower. Uh, at least Sofian was telling me that. So less combined horsepower, I think. So um, another brand which I think is kind of doing well right now, but I'm curious about the future, and this will probably be the brand that we, we finish up with today, is the Stellantis brand. So that encompasses Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Alfa Romeo, Fiat. So they've always been kind of the 
the, the, the can do with the least brand, right? They, they've never had the big pockets of Ford or GM, the deep pockets, but they've always done the most with the least, uh, and they've been kicked around a lot. And I think that gave them kind of a chip on their shoulder and made them work very hard uh, in Detroit. Uh, but I think the recent acquisition by the French has probably not been good for the brand. And it starts with the name, right? Stellantis, once again, everybody makes a joke, but it sounds like a boner medication. It doesn't sound like a car brand. Now, I think that some of the current stuff is the new stuff that just came out is very pretty attractive. I think like the Grand Cherokee is really good. Um, Grand Cherokee L is fine. But then they have a lot of aging products, uh, anything with the Dodge brand on it, basically, the Charger, the Challenger. Um, it's just old, right? Really old. And it's still selling because it's cool, but how long can they, they make that last? We also see um, the, the, the Ram trucks are pretty good still, but once again, I'd love to see a push toward the new style of turbocharged so engines. So, um, so I think Jeep, you know, is still doing really, really well, and I think Ram is. Do I think Ram uh, took uh, the third place uh, pickup truck uh, in, you know, in a field of five, and moved way up to maybe rival, at least in terms of desirability, with Ford, with the Silverado, and with the F one hundred and fifty. I think that was incredible that they were able to do that. Uh, so I think I think Ram has done really really well in the truck world. They built some of the best trucks out there. The interiors, the quality, the reliability, the design—they're all just right on par. I think Jeep, you know, until Bronco came along, just owned that space. Uh, but now with Bronco, they're I think starting to show some cracks in the veneer uh, because Jeep uh, has been um, the same for a lot of generations, right? The JK, the JL. Uh, they're not that different. Mm. And I also think that um, certain Jeep products, I'm not really that impressed with. Like the Wagoneer and the, the Grand Wagoneer, they just don't move the needle for me relative to this competition, and especially from the price point that they're offered at. It's the other thing, too, is like we were just in the Grand Cherokee 4 by a great vehicle, but the price was just astronomical. And you're like, where is the, where is kind of some of the value here? I think they've done a pretty good job upping their quality recently. A lot of the new stuff is much better than like the Daimler era. And uh, what I'm worried about is the move toward the, 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 the kind of the French merger because the French have historically never succeeded in the American market and um, most of the time have failed in heroic ways. I just don't <laughs> think that the French understand America and they really, I don't think, understand Jeep. Um, so I'm really worried about what we're going to see out of the brand in the next coming years. It, of course, takes a few years for the product cycles to, to, to change or for new products to come in. But, like, they just – I've never seen – the French are very good at cooking. They're very good at making interesting cars in the 1970s. But off-roading and kind of Americana has never been their, their sweet spot. So I'm going to be curious to see how they manage that. Well, I think that um, also Dodge is just knocked out of the ballpark with the Hellcats, right? Oh, well, yeah. Right? I mean, that, it was a way to, for them to print money, right? They took a, basically a vehicle that was loosely based on an AGD yeah, class. Yeah, I think that's unfair, though. That, 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 that is – it's much more than just printing money. You know, they took something that would have been old and outdated, and they made it modern and relevant, and made it more than that. They made it cool. That's so, what Tesla's trying to do with the Model S, though. They're kind of going the Hellcat route, right? They just keep shoving more horsepower in that no, puppy. It's, but it's not, not about just horsepower, Tommy. This is what I was saying about the Model S. You, you know, Tesla does stealth, right? So unless you see that little plaid badge on the back of it, you don't know it's a plaid. What Hellcats do is they scream, "We are the biggest balls." the biggest, you know, bat in the cage, right? Because they've got wide bodies and big tires and huge exhaust and huge nostrils and, you know, huge ad attitude. And that's the problem. If Tesla had actually made the plaid, not like this, you know, goofy space ball thing, but it actually had made it like fire breathing, then people would be like, holy cow, I want one of those. I don't want a plaid because it just looks like every other Model S. It looks like the Model S that, you know, our neighbor's wife is driving, right? I want a car that, 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 that screams, I am cool. And for some reason, Tesla does not do any, like, cool versions of their cars. They just keep cranking out, like, six colors, two interiors, four wheels, and it's just boring, dude, just boring. Sorry. The technology was good 10 years ago. It was, you know, it's still class leading. But when we first had our Model 3, like the updates, you know, it got quicker. It went from 0 to 60 and 4.9 to 4.7. Now the updates are like the iPhone and the Tesla, right, where, hey, we've done a security update. I'm like, yeah, grand, good. So you've patched something that should never had a hole in it. Big freaking deal. So that's where I think Tesla's in trouble. They need to, like, 
They need to, I mean, there's a reason that all car companies do different models and create first editions and create all this cool stuff. The Tesla has said, no, we're different. We don't do that. But it also gives me no reason to buy the car at this point. If you've owned a Tesla Model 3, why would you buy another one? If you've owned a Model S, why would you buy another one? It's just you're just, you know, buying the same pair of jeans. Yeah, but some people like the same pair of jeans. Anyways, I do think you're right. The with the Charger Challenger, they've done a great job of keeping it relevant and exciting. Although it's time, and it's this, been around since 08, oh, it, and it feels old. It's time for it to. And, and it's this week they're actually rolling out some new product. So right, so go we'll to see what they do. Com and you'll see what what's next in the Dodge world. All right, guys, well, let us know what you think in the comments below. I'll, obviously, we need a lot of brands we didn't talk about, and we can continue this in the next podcast. But as always, it's been Tommy and Roman saying thanks for watching and. Uh, yeah, thank you for all your support. Thank you to our Patreon members uh, who, you know, make a lot of the stuff we do possible. And thank you, Tommy, for taking an hour of your time and chatting with me. We'll see you in the next video. Ciao.